Now, the latest from ITV News Meridian in the South. Good evening and welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines here in the South. Cheers and best wishes. The Queen celebrates her 90th birthday in Windsor with thousands of well wishes. We've been stood just there for nearly six hours. Yeah. Well worthwhile. Absolutely wonderful. Tonight, I'm live inside the castle with all the colour of the day, plus the lighting of the beacons. Celebrations continue right across the South in honour of Elizabeth R. Good evening. Tonight, celebrations for the 90th birthday of the Queen. Queen Elizabeth Alexandra Mary, our longest reigning monarch who's been on the throne for 63 years. Tributes and well wishes have been pouring in from all around the globe and the eyes of the world have been firmly fixed on her home in Windsor. Yes, the place she chose to celebrate this most special birthday and where thousands of people line the streets to see her. Aaron, Divya Coley is live for us in Windsor tonight and Divya, what a very special day for the town. Yes, Fred, very special indeed. It's been a day of colour, of excitement, of great atmosphere. Thousands of people wanting to join the Queen in her 90th birthday celebrations. And they didn't want to be anywhere else, flying their flags and waiting for the Queen to greet them. There were renditions of happy birthday and they certainly made it a celebration to remember. This is what greeted the Queen for her 90th birthday celebrations. Happy birthday to the Queen! The streets were packed with people waving flags. Some of the Queen's super fans have been camped here for days. Happy birthday to my Majesty. This is Camilla. <laughs> yes, well she was had a very, very early start because she was up at one o'clock this morning. And uh, so I think she's a little bit tired now. We hope she continues until 110. <laughs> camping then, you were camping outside? Yeah, in my bed for the night. And how was that? It was great, great atmosphere. Yeah, yeah it was uh, these people up here, they were with us, and uh, we sang happy birthday at five past midnight to the Queen. At exactly midday, with the sun shining, she stepped out from the castle gate to cheers and a sea of red, white and blue. Julia McCarthy Fox from Horsham got up extra early to make sure she had a front row seat. She's a regular at royal events and today she was one of the lucky ones to have a few minutes of the Queen's time. I gave her some flowers, she asked whether they were from the garden, which they always are, as she very well knows. And I gave her a set of pictures, which she's going to have a look at later. She just came towards us and we reached out with the flowers that we brought and she took them from us and said, that's very kind, thank you. Windsor is used to pomp and ceremony, but today was extra special for those who live here. We do this better than anybody else, you know, we do this pomp and ceremony better than any other nation and it's a chance to feel really proud. The, the, the royal family are here regularly, we see the flag above the castle and know that she's in. Um, she's seen around the town occasionally, um, so it, it's just, it's kind of home. Of course, no birthday is complete without a cake for Her Majesty an orange drizzle made by Bake Off winner Nadia Hussein. Wearing citrus green, the Queen left the Guildhall in her open top Bentley, waving to the crowds as she went down Pease God Street, normally full of shoppers, today full of well-wishers. Some took in the sights a little bit more leisurely, like Norman Oxley, who met the Queen a few years ago. And there's something about the lady, you, when I met her, I mean, it was only for a short, very short time, but she just seemed to know that you, know, you felt at ease with her. It's taken months of planning to organise a big birthday bash such as this for our longest reigning sovereign. Judging from the reaction here, it was worth it. 
Well, in the last few minutes, we've just received these pictures of a of a camera that was placed on the Queen's car, uh, showing her journey through the town. And of course, in all that birthday planning was the level of security. We saw police spotters on the roofs, we saw armed officers on the ground, and the roads were closed from nine o'clock this morning until the Queen went back into the castle for lunch. Um, you can see by these aerial pictures that Windsor was so busy today, but everything went smoothly. The crowds were in good spirits. The Queen and the Duke seemed very happy, and the day has been described as a great success. What a day, Divya, thank you very much indeed. Well, at seven o'clock this evening, the Queen will light a beacon in Windsor, the first of a thousand that will be lit right across the country. And Mike Pierce is live where they are preparing for her to arrive in less than an hour. Mike, how's it going? It's all going very well, I can tell you. Many, many people here, and this is the beacon that we will see lit. Uh, she will light a fuse, the Queen will light the fuse uh, in about an hour's time, and then it will fly a uh, uh, light, and then there'll be a thousand right across the United Kingdom. As you can see, hundreds of people are here. Some people have been here all day uh, in Windsor. Uh, you were here first thing this morning. I was, yep. Yep. Uh, to come and celebrate uh, the monarch's birthday. It's a very special day, very proud day. Why in particular did you want to come today? Um, I think Windsor is the sort of town where everyone's friendly and welcoming um, and the Queen is, you know, she's such a big symbol for everybody and it was just such an honour to come and see her on her 90th. OK, let's move down the line here. Uh, you've been here all day as well? We have, yeah. We arrived about half eight this morning with my sister and we got to meet the Queen. We were at the front and we've handed her some flowers and wished her a happy birthday. And what did she say? She said... She just nodded her head and uh, I think there was a whisper of thank you and then she was on her way. So, yeah, it was actually wonderful. Of course, this is very much the start, isn't it, of a whole number of uh, celebrations. Uh, the pageant here in Windsor coming up in May and events in the Mall in June. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, it's, it's, I mean, big celebrations for the Queen. And why not? You know, she's, she's loved. She's, you know, we, yeah, she's absolutely loved as, as a nation. And we need to celebrate that. And I know you were here yesterday as well. Uh, you're going to be at the other events? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to the uh, pageant in May. And Troop in the Colour as well. Yeah, it'll be my 14th Troop in the Colour. So, yeah. OK, well, well good luck. And uh, as we said, that beacon will be lit in around an hour's time. And you can see hundreds of thousands of people continuing uh, the uh, celebrations tonight. Brilliant, Mike. Thank you so much. Well, as we said, over a thousand beacons will be lit nationwide. Here now, just a few of the places in our region. Bryce Norton in Oxfordshire, Donington Castle in Newbury. Farnham Castle, the University of Winchester and Hurst Castle in the Solent. Corfe Castle, Wareham, Osborne House on the Isle of Wight and Crawley Borough Council. And of course, for a list of all the places, head to our website and you will find out more about the beacons that are near you. Well, as well as the thousands of well-wishers in Windsor, many others have sent birthday messages of our monarch, including the Prime Minister. For all of us in this chamber who seek to play our part in public service, it is truly humbling to comprehend the scale of service that Her Majesty has given to our country over so many years. Many people across the country today will be wishing Her Majesty a very happy 90th birthday and these benches send our warmest greetings to add to that. Yeah. May I say, Mr Speaker, as a relatively young whippersnapper, I'm fully in favour of our country having leaders of a finer vintage. <laughs> Before today, a series of portraits were taken of the Queen and her family at Windsor Castle and showing her fun side. Well, here she is on the stone steps with some of her beloved corgis, all the photos taken by American photographer Annie Leibovitz. In this one of the Queen with her great-grandchildren and great-grandchildren with the youngest Princess Charlotte on her lap and Sarah Phillips' daughter Mia Tyndall holding her handbag. Lovely photograph. You're watching ITV News here in the Meridian region. Thanks for choosing us. Coming up, how the South Coast celebrated the Queen's birthday from Portsmouth, where these school children also had a day to remember, to Lymington and another royal in our region.
Police have offered a £5,000 reward for information that could convict whoever carried out a hammer attack in Portsmouth. Detectives want to trace this man as part of their investigation. A 17-year-old assaulted in the city on Monday the 11th of April. A man and a woman have been arrested after a stabbing in Bournemouth. It happened in St Ledger's Place off Holdenhurst Road last night. A man was stabbed several times and is in a stable condition in Southampton General Hospital. A 26-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder and a 45-year-old woman for assisting an offender. The family of an army corporal who killed herself two years after alleging she was raped have condemned a catalogue of failures by the army. Anne-Marie Element was found hanged in her Wiltshire barracks in October 2011, but it took five years for the army to take her rape allegations to court. Two soldiers, Jeremy Jones and Thomas Fulton, were yesterday cleared of the crime. After the hearing at Bulford, Corporal Element's family spoke out about the way the case was handled. As the judge himself noted in very strong terms, this case should have been heard five years ago. The family welcomed the judge's comments about the extremely unpleasant and dishonourable conduct of the defendants, and they share the judge's concerns about the culture within the Royal Military Police. Now it's known as the silent killer, but now pioneering research in Portsmouth could bring hope to women with ovarian cancer. More than 7,000 cases are diagnosed each year, but treatment can often be a case of trial and error. Now that's because tumours are so resistant and so different in each patient. But now scientists are working on changing all of that, as Christine Olsford can tell us. Dawn Baxter is undergoing her third round of chemotherapy for ovarian cancer inside two years. She's lost her hair and on her bad days it leaves her exhausted on the sofa, unable to move. But most worrying of all, at the moment neither Dawn or her doctors really know if the debilitating drugs she's receiving are the very best for her. I have young children and my husband, for them to have to see me doing this every few months, it becomes unfortunately a way of life and, and I would rather they didn't have to have this way of life and if I knew that the medicine I was having was more personalised towards me and potentially more effective for me at the end of the day, then it, it makes it all worthwhile. Dawn from Waterlooville is involved in a study being run at Portsmouth's Queen Alexandra Hospital. Its findings could rewrite the rules on tackling a disease which claims more than 4,000 lives every year. At the moment, months and months can be wasted trying different drugs that just don't work. And that's why this study is so important, because it should help remove that trial and error. A particular analogy is like you have a headache, some people will take paracetamol, some people will take aspirin or some people will take ibuprofen. All we want to do is make the best drug available to treat ovarian cancer available to that patient for their particular tumour. Using samples of fluid from patients, scientists are testing which drug therapies act most effectively on a woman's particular type of cancer cells. They're compiling a complex database which will enable doctors to prescribe much more targeted treatments in the future. A simple lab test will show which drugs are likely to be most successful for new patients right from the moment they're diagnosed. Survival rates for late stage ovarian cancer are poor and late diagnosis is common because the symptoms are so difficult to detect. It's often mistaken for the onset of the menopause, for example, or irritable bowel syndrome. The Portsmouth research a potential lifesaver. For them to be able to sort of turn around and say that we think actually that this is what you need to have to deal with your cancer in the way that's most effective for you, it's just, yeah, it's just mind-blowing to be honest. Early findings look extremely promising. The final results should not only save lives, but the NHS millions of pounds. Christine Osford, ITV News. More news now from around our region and visiting times have been restricted at Basingstoke Hospital after an outbreak of the winter vomiting virus. People have been asked to only go and see sick friends and relatives between 6 and 7 p.m. until further notice and to make sure they wash their hands to stop the spread of the infection. 
In the lead up to the local elections on the 5th of May, Crime Stoppers is joining forces with the Electoral Commission to raise awareness about electoral fraud. Last year, more than 480 cases were recorded by police. The use of camera drones has been debated in the House of Lords today. The remote-controlled miniature helicopters are already being used by Sussex police in the skies above Gatwick Airport. A committee discussed privacy issues and reports of a collision with a plane at Heathrow. Brighton Council has announced three major developments in the city. A new deal could spell the end of its conference centre with an arena expected to replace it. Hove Library will close and an outdoor swimming centre would bring seafront investment to one billion pounds. And remember for more on all of our stories in the south you can head to our website idb.com forward slash meridian. You can call us, the number is on the screen now or you can get in touch via Facebook or send us a tweet at ITV Meridian. Now, should we stay or should we go? As if you don't already know, on the 23rd of June, Britain holds a referendum to decide whether to remain in the European Union or not. Ahead of that historic vote, ITV's political editor, Robert Peston, has been examining what staying in or opting out really means to all of us. Tonight, in the first of two programmes, he tackles the EU question head on. Delighted to say he's with us now. Robert Peston, both sides have been shouting their claims for staying in or for leaving the EU. What have we learned so far? And are you going to make it all crystal clear for viewers in your tonight programmes? And what I try and do with my programme is highlight the issues around immigration, try and give people the, the, the information that will allow them to judge what they want to judge in terms of, you know, if, if you want lower migration, um, some people do. I hope I've given people the information which will help them to decide whether that is going to happen in or out. If you're worried about security, if you're worried about the sovereignty of parliament, I hope that I'm giving you the information that will allow you to decide, you know, what the impact will be in or out. In a nutshell, what's gaining the most attention for staying in? Uh, what is oh the economy? I mean, you know, without a shadow of doubt. I mean, the thrust of their argument has been all around how if we leave, we'll be poorer. Um, and I would broadly say that they are winning the argument. As I say, it's not to say that we'll be devastatingly poorer. Um, likelihood is we'll be a bit poorer. And the best reason with the voters for opting out? On the sort of ukip side of the argument, uh, it's all about limiting immigration. Uh, on the sort of uh, rebel Tory cabinet side of the argument, it's much more to do with sovereignty, bringing back powers to Parliament. We have the MP for Whitney in our region, of course, who happens to be the Prime Minister, David Cameron. Does he now regret, do you think, calling a referendum? I think it's all been a bit more of a nightmare than he would have anticipated. He didn't expect that the Tory party's most fearsome campaigner, Boris Johnson, would be against him. Uh, and I don't think he quite anticipated the extent to which this would dominate the entire business of government, uh, leading, I think, him to a number of other banana skins. Will David Cameron stand down if he does lose this one? I think it's incredibly difficult to see circumstances in which he could survive. It would be, I think, a shattering blow to his authority if he lost. And I think he would be gone very quickly if he lost. Good to talk to you. Looking forward to your programmes, Robert Peston. Thanks for your time. Pleasure. Thank you. And you can see Robert's report on the Tonight programme. That's Europe in or out at 7.30pm here on ITV. And back now to the Queen's birthday celebrations and a surprise visit by the Royal Marines Band has helped a school in Portsmouth to celebrate today. Indeed, the children at Solent Infant School were in the middle of their assembly when the musicians arrived with their regal fanfare. Andrew Pate was there too. Dressed for Her Majesty in red, white and blue, this is an assembly they'll never forget. Members of the Royal Marines Band making a surprise visit much to the youngsters' shock and delight. The regal fanfare marking the Queen's 90th birthday. And they even had a special visit. We were slightly worried that it might be too loud in this quite small auditorium and there might be a few tears, but thankfully there weren't uh, only cheers. 
Throughout her reign, the Queen has been a regular visitor to Portsmouth and the Royal Navy. Her son, Prince Andrew, a Navy pilot on board HMS Invincible. Today, at Fort Blockhouse in Gosport, a 21-gun salute in her honour. While the children spelled out E2R, Elizabeth II, Regina, the Queen. We think the Queen is special and, and she's a special person to our country. I think that um, she's really nice and kind and um, she, she's really important. A lot of the children at Solent Infant School have parents in the Royal Navy. We're quite a unique school in the sense that we have a large group of service pupils who attend here. So for us today it was about bringing the Queen's birthday to life and I certainly think we've done that. If you were the king of this country and it was your big birthday today, what would you like to do? Would you like to have a big party? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see my family because, you know, if you're a king, you have to do a lot of things. So yeah, you so. Won't have like time to spend time with your family. Happy birthday, Andrew Pate, ITV News, Portsmouth and a day they won't forget. Sure. Now, a little earlier we showed you some of the official photographs that have been released today of Her Majesty the Queen. Yes, here's another one of her at Windsor Castle with her daughter, Princess Anne. Well, the Princess Royal was at the Royal Yacht Club in Lymington on the edge of the New Forest today. Yes, Princess Anne's been a patron of the club since 1980 and was invited to formally open their new pontoons. There also, Sally Simmons. The GB sailing team's new 420 crew are making sure everything's ship -shape before the royal visit. It's so cool. I mean, I'm meeting the yeah. Queen's daughter. <laughs> it's amazing that she's supporting the club. I think that's really good. Yeah. Nice. The boats are dressed overall as the Royal Lymington Yacht Club welcomes its patron, Her Royal Highness Princess Anne, to formally open their new pontoons. At 65 years old, Princess Anne could well be thinking about retiring but just like her mother, that word just doesn't seem to feature in their vocabulary. Despite a chilly and brisk wind, Princess Anne took her time to talk to all the young sailors. The royal family has a long tradition with the sea. The Royal Yacht Britannia used to anchor off the Isle of Wight for Cow's Week from the 1950s through to the 90s, where Princess Elizabeth, as she was then, came sailing and the Duke of Edinburgh used to race. Prince Charles was sometimes crew. The Princess Royal today praised the Royal Lymington Yacht Club for enthusing youngsters. But as well as supporting this sport, here she's on board one of the British Steel Challenge yachts in the 1990s. Princess Anne is also apparently very competent. Absolutely, she's very accomplished. She, uh, she gets in there and she, she helmed the uh, Swan 40 I was on on a Thursday night up the river with the spinnaker up and it's quite a breezy day so yeah she can definitely, definitely sail. So we made her the Port Genoa trimmer and she did very well and then she helmed the boat from the racetrack back up the river to the marina. A toast to their patron and a toast to the Queen on her birthday. Sally Simmons, ITV News, Lymington. And you've been posting your messages on our Facebook page. Let's start with Lucy Thompson. Lucy says, happy birthday, Your Majesty. Both my nans turn 90 this year and they inspire me. Happy birthday, nans. Claire Kemp said, may your day be filled with joy and happiness. You are what makes this country great. Happy birthday to you, Your Majesty. Well said. Irene Hackett, who now lives in Australia, says, it makes me wish I still lived in Windsor to be part of the celebrations. D D Digby said, she's such a hard-working queen who's dedicated her life to her country and kept her promise to do so. I admire this lady immensely. Thank you so much for getting in touch and plenty more of your comments on our Facebook page. Meanwhile, two giant statues of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh have been causing a bit of a stir at a village on the outskirts of Windsor. Yes, the massive sculptures gaze out from the front garden of 83-year-old Ben <laughs> Bennett, who bought them in a clearance sale at a shop in London five years ago. In that time, hundreds of people have stopped to photograph the couple, even some, he says, who might have royal connections. Well, 
Oh. Well, our own royalty now. I'm afraid it's only Simon. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> um, but now, it's been a bit of a struggle today <laughs> to look at the TV news without seeing Windsor Castle. Yes. Of course, it's one of the landmarks in our region. Yes. So it got me thinking we should have a look at some other landmarks mm -hmm. whilst we're here. So Good. some gorgeous pictures that have been coming into our Meridian Weather at ITV.com inbox. So here's the first one. That's Brill Windmill. Oh, Does that look beautiful? Great picture. Sunrise or sunset, by the way, Jerry? Oh, I knew you were going to sunrise, start this. Rise. Sunset oh. from Anthony P. Morris there. Uh, here's a picture that Stefan Olek took. He's oh, from Verwood, great. overlooking Spinnaker Tower in Portsmouth. Sunset. Loved the colours <laughs> that came through. <laughs> yes, very good. Very early. Could have been very early in the morning, couldn't it? And uh, the sky on this picture from Nick Lucas. Isn't it gorgeous? A week ago today, Horton Tower in Dorset which according to Wikipedia is on the boundary between the chalk downland of Cranbourne Chase and the heathland of the New Forest, you know. Nice. Another tower, uh, this one from Martin Dolan, is the Philosopher's Tower in Wimborne, Wimborne St. Giles, that's sunrise. Uh, built around 1700 by the third Earl of Sols Shaftesbury, rather. And uh, finally, the West Pier in Brighton from Rob Chisholm, which also holds the sun if you're there at the right time of day. So some very lovely pictures. From sunrise tomorrow, a lovely day. I doubt it. Oh, he doubts it. Let's hear the worst. Simon Parkin. From blizzards to pool, driving through Europe, Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. I know you might have spotted a fair bit of cloud in the skies that the flags were flying in today and that sets the scene for the weather to turn a bit messy over the next 24 hours. The cloud is going to thicken up overnight tonight and we've got some rain edging up from the southwest as well. It doesn't really get to us until tomorrow morning. It doesn't really get that far either, but it will start to feel a bit different. And come the weekend, you'll notice how much colder it is as well with uh, cold air coming straight down from the frozen north. Temperatures will struggle to get into double figures. But back to tonight. And well, it's a cloudy one. There'll be a few clear spells here and there, but at least it's not too cold. Six or seven, the overnight low. And then tomorrow morning, it's down towards the south where we'll see that rain start to edge in. Mostly light and patchy, drier further north. There'll also be an odd bright spell too. And the rain doesn't really move that far up, but it will be a bit damp for some of us through the afternoon, but cold everywhere. Temperatures are lowly nine or ten degrees, and you will notice that breeze starting to develop as well. As for the high tide times, you can see in Portsmouth, Quarter to two in the morning, two o'clock in the afternoon. Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. And after the break, there'll be the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale at Windsor Castle and Mark Austin in the studio. Stacey Poole will have our late news, but we leave you now with celebrations across the South for the Queen's 90th birthday. More events in May, of course, but there was plenty to enjoy today and enjoy it we did. From us all, good night. Good night. Bye-bye.